my name is Jason Friedman. Welcome to our presentation on setting up portrait lighting using grip equipment. A few things before we start. This is a live broadcast, so if you want to take a break or you're having troubles viewing it or you don't have enough bandwidth, whatever, we will be archiving this in a HD version and 48 hours afterwards we'll be sending you a link so you could access this. So if you can't see it or don't want to see it now, and go ahead and have it a good time, please do, and we'll see you later. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is our C-stand. So the C-stand is our base. It's our most fundamental piece of grub equipment. And if you ever see a film set or a video production, you will see sometimes dozens, not hundreds, of the C-stands there. So the C-stand here we have basically consists of three items that make up this kit. So we have the C-stand itself. Then over here, we have our grip head which is this guy right here. And it's essentially a baby receiver and with two discs and a nice big old handle. And then we have our grip arm, which is essentially a grip head mounted on a 40 inch piece of steel tubing. I want you to watch this quick video on the C-Stand and it'll give you a great introduction. This quick video will demonstrate the game-changing Kupo 40 inch Master C-Stand with Turtle Base. Too fast for you? Here's a close up in slow motion. As you have just seen, the third Kupo innovation is the Master C Stand with Turtle Base. This is not your daddy's C Stand. This unique feature enables the still or moving image maker to open and collapse the legs of the base in under a second. This is all possible thanks to a patented, spring-loaded quick-release mechanism that's super easy to use. Just follow these simple steps to open the base. Hold the C-stand so the riser section is parallel to the ground with the legs extended upwards towards the ceiling. Just pull the locking collar towards you until gravity starts to separate the legs. Once gravity takes hold of the legs, release the spring-loaded locking collar and the legs will automatically lock into their respective positions. Place the light fixture on top of your light stand and you're ready to rock and roll. Not only is it easy, but it's fun too. Now that we have the stand open, just follow these simple steps to close it. Hold the C-stand so that the riser section is parallel to the ground with the largest leg extended upwards towards the ceiling. Pull the locking collar towards you. Once gravity takes hold of the legs, release the spring-loaded locking collar and the legs will automatically lock into their closed position. Kupo is not just an innovative company, but a company that pays attention to all the fine detail work that makes Kupo quality stand out amongst the crowd. The Master C-Stand features a zinc alloy base casting that's over five times stronger than aluminum to sustain the heavy weight of sandbags and people standing on it. The hollow junior pin receiver allows debris to pass through for easier cleaning and maintenance. Solid aluminum castings house the internal brakes that push against the risers to lock them securely in place. Some other brands have no internal brakes and the bolt causes damage to the riser section. The castings are fitted with stainless steel helicoil inserts to prevent the castings from being stripped. Now you're ready to travel or store your stand for future use. This stand has what's known as a turtle base that allows you to separate the base section from the riser section. To do this, hold the stand so that the base is supported on the ground. Just loosen the knob located just above the spring-loaded locking collar. Once loose, the riser section easily removes from the base for transport or storage. Now that's a wrap. Thank you for watching. When it comes to your vision and your image making equipment, at Kupo, we simply say, never let go. Wasn't that the coolest C-stand you've ever saw? Another great thing about C-stands that we didn't cover in that video was something called nesting. Joe, would you just pan down to the bases of these, please? What's really cool, old C-stands have three legs at three varying heights. What this enables you to do is place one leg under the other and put them very close to each other. This is excellent if you want to place modifiers, accessories, or even light fixtures extremely close to one another. As well as for storage, it really saves a lot of space. And also, if you're working in a very tight, confined space, you don't have these broad bases that you might have in another traditional type of light stand. 
So let me show you how to properly set up a C-stand head and arm. As you see here, we have our hand. I'm going to turn the handle facing camera. So the grip head is facing you guys. Now, the rule of thumb is righty tighty, lefty loosey. What we mean by that is on the grip head where the load is going to be placed, you always want that off to the right side of where your grip head is. The reason why that is, is when you crank down, because clockwise tightens righty tighty, as you put more weight or load on this guy, it's going to actually tighten itself even further and give you a nice secure grip. If you do it the wrong way, the opposite, lefty loosey, and go to this side, what's going to happen is, as you apply more and more pressure, it's just going to loosen up on itself and it'll never get tight. So if you ever want to look around the set and see who the new guy is on the set, they'll be placing it on the wrong side and the left side. So remember, always place your load to the right side. And also, I'm going to have Rick hand me a sandbag. So we have a sandbag here. We call this the silent grip because they never complain, don't have to pay them anything, and they always get the job done on time. So we just take our sandbag, we place it over one of the legs. Joe, if you could just pan down and show them where the positioning of the sandbag is placed. What this does is this weights it down because the C-stand, even though it's solid steel and extremely strong, has a very small base. If I move this bag out of the way for a second, you would notice that just with a very little amount of force, I could tip this over. But when I replace my sandbag on the leg, I could have a lot of force and it's not going anywhere. This is especially important if you have what we call civilians entering a set, non-studio type people and or kids. Kids are notorious for breaking things, so if you value your lights, your equipment, or even your model's head, I would highly advise you to use sandbags on set. Now I want to go into our background. We're going to use something called Seamless. Seamless is just a fancy term for a roll of paper. Savage is the most popular brand. Today we'll be using a nine foot gray roll of Seamless. And I'm going to show you how we're going to set up or rig Seamless. Rigging is a term, just means setting up or supporting a roll of Seamless with two C-stand kits. So let me just bring this over here and I'll show you how it's done. So what we're going to do is remember the righty tidy lefty loosey law. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm going to have my handle on the back over here on this side, parallel to the ground, and then Rick's going to have his handle on the front side because they're each going towards the right. I'm going to slide this together. You want to leave a little bit of space on the side so it's not butting right up against it. Just I'm going to move it over and center it a bit. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pre-roll it onto the ground. So what we do is we unroll it, and you see it has a natural roll. And once it gets down to the ground, we'll give it a little bit of help. And this prevents it from actually getting all wrinkled on you. Okay, Rick, that should be good. So now Rick is going to take an A-clamp. It's just a standard A-clamp you can get at any home home store like Home Depot, they're only a couple of bucks and that locks it in place. So now what we're going to do is we're going to raise this up. So we're going to unlock our first riser, so the top knob, and take this up nice and slow until it stops. And now we're going to take our second riser and we're going to raise this up as well until it stops. Perfect. Thank you. So now we got a nice beautiful background and all we needed was two C-stand kits. We didn't need any special background support systems to actually rig it up. So the next thing we do is talk about how to light our background. So when we want to light our background, we want to think of where we're going to put our lights. Now if we took our lights and we just placed them off at the very edge and we aimed them at the edge, then obviously the center would get quite dark. So what we want to do is we actually want to place our, or direct our lights Pretend if we took it and we divided our background in half. So basically between the center point and the edge, we want most of our light angled towards that space in between on both sides. Same thing top to bottom. If that's your top and that's your bottom, this is your midpoint, you want your height of your lights to be approximately in the center between the top and the center and the center and the bottom, so right about here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to grab a light stand over here and I already have one head on top. Let me just line it up with my marks over here. Just place this down for a second. Okay, 
And what I'm going to do is, I'm, if you notice that my light is actually faced away from the background, that's intentional. I'll show you why, because we're going to use a nice big reflector called a V-flat to give us a nice reflected soft light to fill your background. But normally, I want to put another light low. This, I'm going to actually light the entire background evenly. This you really have to do if you're doing full length, if you're doing fashion. Here we're doing really portraiture, so I wouldn't have to need it, but I just want to illustrate the point that when you're trying to light a full length background, or actually do a full length model, you'll need to light your background evenly, because you'll have to pull back far enough where you get a pretty wide background. So I'm going to now mount a light onto the column section. We could just use another light stand, but the problem with that is it's going to take up more cost because you have more equipment and it gets a little cumbersome with all this equipment on set. So instead, I'm going to have Rick hand me a three-way clamp. So this is a three-way clamp with a stud right on it. And if you could just zoom in on that, Joe, I'm going to hold it up for you guys so you can see it. It's a really cool clamp. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this around the main riser section on the bottom here of my stand. And just one button locks in place, and then I'm going to lock it down. I'm going to take my second light head, my second Perfoto D1, I'm going to place it on the stud, and then I'm going to lock it down in place. Excellent. So I want to get them approximately parallel, which they are. And now we're going to show you a short video on the three and four way clamp system, which will further illustrate the point. In this quick video, we will demonstrate how to use Kupo's revolutionary three way clamp. I think you'll agree that it is like no other clamp you have ever seen. This all metal cast aluminum clamp features a unique spring locking mechanism that allows you to instantly latch and release the locking collar around any tubing size from 1 to 1.4 inches in diameter. Press the button to release the latch. Close the clamp around the riser sections and press the button again to close the latch. Just a quick turn of the tension handle to secure it in place. The three-way clamp has three recessed mounting locations, distributed in 90 degree increments to accept a series of interchangeable accessories. Take any of the three-way clamp accessories, like this short baby stud. Slide the notch into the clamp and tighten the locking collar. Now you're ready to mount light fixtures or any other accessory up to 66 pounds or 30 kilograms. There are three different accessories available for the three-way clamp system. The long baby stud, the short baby stud, and the baby receiver. Here we have a Profoto Giant umbrella. We can attach the three-way clamp around the shaft of the umbrella. We now have three secure locations to mount three Profoto heads. By using combinations of three packs and three heads, we can increase our exposure by one and a half f-stops. Just think of all the ways this clamp can make your life easier. Thank you for watching. When it comes to your vision and your image making equipment, at Kupo, we simply say, never let go. So as I mentioned before, we're going to use V-flats, which are a very common piece of studio gear. If you look over here, you will see a V-flat, and all it consists of is a piece of foam core. It's actually shaped in a V, hence the name V-flat. And this is two standard 4x8 sheets of foam core seamed together on the edge with some gaff tape. So this, we're actually pointing our lights into the center of that V, and then they're bouncing back onto the background. Now this has two great advantages. Number one, it's actually preventing the spill or light from coming back onto the model. And number two, it's producing a huge surface area, which is giving you a super soft, even light, so you get a nice, even background. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly meter my background to make sure we have an even exposure across the whole thing. So. Let's start with this side over here. Perfect, F4, down here. Love it, F4, nice and even. And now let's try this side over here. Whoops. Begin position first. F4, and last but not least, the top right corner. F4, excellent. So we have a nice even background to play with. We're going to talk about background spill, but before I do that, we're going to place our subject into, the di into our set over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab a stool and put it in our pre-positioned path. And now I'm going to introduce to you our model, Candace. Candace, please come on set. Have a seat. 
so I want to talk about spill. Spill light is actually light reflecting from the background that you really don't want. As you know, anything you bounce, even a black subject, which reflects less, but it still reflects light. So if you have your background too close to your model, what's going to happen is it's going to wrap around. It's going to wrap around the cheeks. So that way it's going to be more lighting than you want. You really can't control your spill light that well. So you want to make sure you have a good distance behind. Another thing we're doing is we're making sure that our V-flats are actually behind our model, which they are. So this way you don't have to worry about them giving direct light from your background lights and illuminating the sides of your model. I want to show you now a clock face diagram. And the reason why I created this clock face diagram is just to show you where the lights are positioned in relation to the set. So as you'll see at 12 o'clock, you will see you have the camera. And in the center of the circle, you will have the model, canvas. And at 6 o'clock, you will have her background. And then around, you have like the time. So when I refer to light positioning or placement, I just refer to the time so you know exactly around that clock face the light should be positioned. I want to introduce the next piece of equipment to, called the high roller stand. So if Rick just pushes in our high roller stand over here. And the reason why I'm using such a large stand is because we're going to use our key light, which is our main light, on a boom. So when you're dealing with a boom, it's not just the boom itself. It's the boom, it's the light fixture, as well as a counterweight. In this case, we're using 15-pound sandbag. So cumulatively, we're talking about 30 pounds, which is quite a bit of weight. You don't want to put that on a stand that only supports 10 pounds. Otherwise, it could cause injury to someone, which we don't want to do to our model. So here we go, and we have our boom set up on top. And the way we set up our boom is this stand does not come with this head. If Joe could just come up and zoom in on this head, this is called our lollipop head, right, with my hands holding to. And the reason why they call it a lollipop is this big round disc is sort of like a lollipop. If you pulled off the handle, it might, in some weird imagination, look like a child's lollipop made out of metal, but not exactly. But anyway, it's the industry term. This is what's called a true combo head. So this is an accessory we put into our standard combo head of the high roller stand. And it's basically just a huge grip head. So you already saw the two and a half inch grip head, which we use on our C-stands. This is a four and a quarter inch C-stand, ah, four and a quarter inch, excuse me, grip head that we're using on top of our lollipop. And in it, we have our boom. So it's just, the boom has an ear, which is just a flange of metal that's sandwiched or compressed between these two plates. And on the end of it, we have our light and our beauty dish. So now we know we're nice and safe, and we have a nice big stand. I just want to, you mentioned, or you heard me mention the term baby before. Now, baby is not what we're normal to, it's a little child, you know, a little human that really can't talk and drools all the time. The baby in this case we're talking about is the size of our accessories. So we're talking about 5 eighths of an inch, which is industry standard, or 16 millimeters. My assistant Rick here has a baby pin, which is this guy right here. So baby pin is standard, and for all you photographers out there who may have thought they were never using grip equipment already, if you own light stands or ever use light stands, in essence you are using grip equipment. And if you notice, all of your stands will have this size standard baby pin, so you all have babies. So this is called a pin or stud, and when somebody refers to baby stud, it's not just a toddler with like shades and a little leather jacket and the tricked out Hot Wheels. It's actually a baby stud. Thanks, Rick. Junior, on the other hand, is the bigger size. And Junior is 1 and 1 eighth inch. It's a bigger size to hold more weight. And so, or 28 millimeters for all of you people who prefer to use the metric system. On top of our, if Joe, could you zoom in on top and show him how we have set up our light fixture? So we actually set up a little bit of a trick here. Rick, could you please grab me a grip head and a pin, please? So up here on top of the end of our boom, the problem with mounting lights at the end of the boom is because the pin comes out laterally or to the side. So what happens is if you mount something off the side and you have a heavy modifier, in this case it's not bad, but if you're using a big softbox, the weight will tend to pull it down and it'll never stay in place. So what we have here is a workaround. Because over here, between these two jaws of our two and a half inch grip head, we have a ton of clamping power because we have this nice big handle, so we can really get a lot of positive grip. So what you'll do is you'll take a pin, a baby pin, you'll put it into the baby receiver, and then this guy will go on to the end of the pin. So now you'll have a nice place to mount your light right on top. And because you have so much more clamping force, this will never rotate like you will have when you have a lot of weight on the standard end of a boom. Thanks, Rick.
So now I'm going to talk to you about counterweighting boom and rigging it properly. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to have my um, assistant Rick to actually come to the other side and actually hold this. Because whenever you're dealing with weight, it's always nice to have some help. You could do it by yourself, but if you are doing this by yourself, by the way, is make sure that the light is nowhere over a model because you don't want to inadvertently come down and cause any damage. So, yeah, <laughs> she doesn't want that either. So, if you notice on one side, if you could zoom over here, Joe, to our sandbag on one side. So you see our sandbag at the end. This is our counterweight, so we got 15 pounds. And then obviously we have our light fixture on the other side. And if you could zoom in over here on these two controls in our boom, this is just a boom extension. So if you loosen this, you could actually telescope it out to reach further. This guy, however, this is just an open hollow sleeve so I can move the whole boom back and forth within it to change my fulcrum point or my balance. I'm going to have Rick support that head while I loosen up the fulcrum point and I'm going to just prove a point. So I'm going to loosen up our grip head and now if we almost let go, it's almost perfectly balanced. What I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to disrupt that balance, I'm going to tighten this down and I'm going to loosen this up and then we're going to slide this more towards me, then I'm going to tighten this again and now watch what happens when I loosen this now there's more weight on the actual sandbag. So now it's unbalanced. So what I want to do is I want to loosen this again and slide it back towards Rick. And then once, if, let's see, if go a little towards you, Rick, and just see if it's balancing on its own. Now it's balancing on its own pretty well, so I'm going to tighten it down. And now we've got a properly balanced boom. This is actually quite vital. Actually, Rick, let me just tighten this down. Let me just spin this down. So I got it over here. Let's just rotate this down a little bit. It, perfect. So we're in position for the actual shoot. Now this is really, really important because if you don't have a properly balanced load, you will have probably, it's probably going to hold. I mean, these are steel stands, but I've seen even professionals with really poorly balanced stands where they've bowed like reeds in the wind. And if this thing ever snaps, obviously you've got a ton of weight, which could cause a lot of problems. We already have a beauty dish, which is going to be our modifier. What a beauty dish is, it's basically just a, a big scoop. And in the front of it, it has a little reflector disc. So the light comes out, bounces off the disc, fills the scoop, and then comes out a little bit softer than you would use it. The reason why they call it a beauty dish is it's used a lot in beauty photography for cosmetics. And it still gives you enough of uh, specular light, so you still have shadows and good edge detail, especially on the facial structures, but it softens it up a bit so you have a um, nice looking skin. So what I'm going to do is set up butterfly lighting. So what butterfly lighting consists of is placing our light directly in front of our subject, pointing down just slightly. Right about there. Rick, you could help me lock off the wheels, please. Thank you. I just want to make sure that our stand doesn't roll all over the place. So now I'm going to meter the light, excuse me, while I grab the meter. Grab my meter, and let's just do a quick exposure test and see what we get. So our ISO today is going to be 160. Perfect, okay. So let's just get our exposure. Okay. So F10, about F8, let's take a shot and see what we got. Just make sure my transmitter's on. It is. Let me just give a quick test. Let's just have a quick look over here and see what we get exposure-wise. That looks pretty good. Our histogram looks excellent. Cool. So the reason why they call it butterfly lighting, by the way, is it actually creates a small shadow right underneath the nose of the subject. So if you actually use an un... If you use a raw light head where it's very speckling, creates a hard shadow, you'll actually see a little shadow under the nose that's the shape of a butterfly. And depending upon whether they have a normal nose or weird nose, the shape of that butterfly might shift considerably, but generally that's the idea. So I'm just going to take a couple of quick shots now. Okay, here we go, Candace. Just change my focusing point. Beautiful. Lovely. Nice. Excellent. Beautiful. Chin down just a touch. Love it. Don't look so horrified. Adorable, cute. Love it. Thank you. Okay. So while those images are actually downloading, 
I'm going to talk about Rembrandt lighting for a bit. So the next type of lighting we do is called Rembrandt lighting. And as you may have heard, is a Dutch painter, Rembrandt. He's a brilliant painter and he's very, very famous. If you're lucky to find one of his paintings at a garage sale, you could probably retire because it's worth millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So the reason why they call it Rembrandt lighting is because if you're a fan of art or an art historian, you will know that the way that this painter, Rembrandt, lit his subjects in his paintings was this way. It was a very three-quarter way. It's called short lighting. And the rumor was that in the studio in Holland, that the way the light rose and fell, the sun rose and fell every night, his windows were positioned to give him that light. So when the subjects were sitting as he painted them, that's the natural lighting that he got. So that is the rumor. But I wasn't able to ask him because I'm not that old. So about our clock face again. Remember our clock face diagram. So when we talk about Rembrandt, we're going to actually position our light at either the 1030 or the 130 position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this light over. Let me just unlock the casters. Thanks, Rick. And I'm going to move this around, get this into position. The thing to know about Rembrandt, which you'll see in a minute, is let me just move this reflector out of the way for the moment. What you'll find is when you do Rembrandt lighting, it's going to actually create a shadow on the other side of the nose. It's going to be actually a triangle of light, an upside down triangle. This is signature to Rembrandt lighting. And if you're a fan of cinema, or you might be now, when you watch movies, you'll see entire movies lit this way, and you'll see that upside down triangle. So that's what we're trying to achieve over here. So the position of the triangle is usually you want it to be the width of the eye, and you want it to extend no lower than to the bottom of the mouth. So that's the position to get it the right angle and the right height. I'm going to take a couple of shots so you can see how this looks. OK. Ready for some Rembrandt? Nice. Turn your face just right here. Just look at my hand straight because I Exactly, dead straight, and that way we'll get the telltale triangle. Yeah, you can look your eyes towards me. Beautiful. Chin down just a touch. Lovely. Love it. Okay. So we're going to wait for those images to come in, and then you should be able to see that telltale triangle. And there it is. If you see on the screen, you'll see that triangle of light right underneath her eye. So this is called Rembrandt lighting, and it's a very common lighting technique, and you'll see this all over in both cinema, video, as well as still photography. So now what we're going to do is notice that those shots, that it's pretty dark on one side because it's a pretty ratio shot. So we're going to add a little more of a light back using a reflector. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rig a reflector. I'm going to show you how we rigged a reflector using some more grip equipment. So if we take this guy over here, I'm actually going to move this into position. Let me just lower this down for the second. And just move this this way and try not to kill everybody in the process. Scoot past here. Thanks. OK, so I'm going to drop this down just so you can see how this is set up. So if you look over here, we basically have three pieces. So we have our standard grip arm, which you guys are already well used to right now. And then we have our little petite clamps, which go around the grip arm. And then we have our studs. This is the same studs and accessories, by the way, that you use for the three and four way clamp. You guys saw that video. And then we have our alley clamps, which are our spring clamps. We have little baby ones. There are also bigger ones available. And we're using them to support our collapsible reflector. So now that you know how we've rigged this up, let me reposition this back into the proper location. It raises this up a bit. So get some fill onto that side. Move this on in. There we go. We have some fill out. So now I'm going to take a couple of shots, and I will show you the difference. But first, let me just quickly meter, and so we can see the difference in ratio between one side and the other. So let me grab my little clicker. OK, so on our key, which is going to be over here, we'll take a meter reading. Actually, guys, it's best if you want to do ratios, you want to, if you have a meter with a retractable dome, you want to turn it down to do metering so you point at the individual. That way, the light from the other side won't affect it. OK, so our key is 7-1. Actually, um, Rick, could you increase the power on that guy? Actually, I have to do it from the remote. So let's go. 
Okay, let me take another reading. We're using the brilliant Profoto Air system, so I'm able to adjust everything from power right here on my little transmitter. It's a beautiful thing. Perfect. Now we got the exact same exposure we were dealing with before on butterflies. So we don't have to change our camera settings. And now let me meet her on the other side. Actually, let me come around so I'm not blocking the light source. And see what we're getting on this side. So we're looking at about 7.1. So we're looking at about a stop and a half difference between our main and the fill. So that is our ratio right now. So let's take some shots. Let me just switch my focusing points. Beautiful. Lovely. Great. Hold that right there. Chin down just a touch. Love it. Beautiful. Now, as you'll see in the photos, as they come in, you'll notice that we actually opened up that quite substantially. So now that opened up that side of the face. So instead of having that big old shadow on that side, it's a much more flattering, open kind of light. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about another accessory. But before I do that, which we'll just look in a second, by the way, instead of using a reflector as we are over here, we could actually use another light head, which is nice because you have a little more control over it, but of course it's then more expense and more gear. So obviously we're using four lights for the background, so this is not a very small production, but just so you know that you can achieve the exact same effect if you have an additional light than using a reflector. So now take a look at our grip arm support video, and right after I'll show you how we use that grip arm support video to rig a backlight or a kicker. Thanks. This quick video will demonstrate the innovative Kupo grip arm support. Kupo has developed an innovative grip arm support that mounts in seconds to both the C-Stance riser section and grip arm. One side of the grip support arm has a dedicated three and four way clamp adapter. Here we place a three way clamp around the riser section of a master C-Stand. Make sure both the length adjustment knob and the double ball tension knob is loose and slide the notch into one of the three mounting locations. Then tighten the lock and collar. On the other side of the grip support arm, there is a built in tiny clamp. Just place the tiny clamp around the grip arm and tighten the set screw until snug. Once both clamps are secure, adjust the position of your grip arm until it is at the desired angle. Then tighten the length adjustment and double ball joint knobs to secure everything in place. Thank you for watching. When it comes to your vision and your image making equipment, at Kupo we simply say, never let go. Now we're going to talk about the grip arm support itself. I'm going to show you it in action. Actually, back here, Rick, please bring in the grip arm support. We're going to actually set up a backlight. And all it is is a C-stand kit with the arm. But since we put quite a bit of weight on the end, we're using our grip arm support that you just saw. And what that's doing is it's providing extra support so we don't have to worry about it sagging or dropping down. And if we needed to, you could actually put quite a bit more weight. And also, Rick is very... Um, wisely has put a sandbag on the base as well and what that does is it gives it extra support because since you are now taking a lot of weight and putting it on the edge remember how easy it was to tip over that I showed you before now you don't have to worry with this sandbag there you could breathe easy and know that your lights not going to come crashing down to the ground so what this is going to do adding our kicker or a backlight or a hair light or sometimes it's even called a separator light there's so many different words rim light and all these basically do is they provide separation now, if it was the case that our model had, let's say, black hair and we had a black background, obviously the, back, the hair would just blend into the background. It would be like a, a floating face. Now, if you like that look, who am I to judge? However, sometimes you might want some separation between your subject and your background. The other advantage, even if you don't have the black on black situation, is if you do add that kicker and edge, it adds a lot less separation, and that separation adds a lot of depth, and it really makes your images come alive. So I advocate using backlights or hair lights all the time. So let's see what we got as far as um, exposure on our back light. OK, let me grab my meter. And we're going to meter our backlight. Wow, that's pretty hot. I'm just going to quickly make an adjustment and drop our power, because right now we're getting F36, which is quite a bit of light. Ah, oh, much better. So now we're looking at F11. So now we're right in the ballpark of the other light. So let's take a shot and see what kind of effect that brings us. 
Nice, beautiful. Just shift my focusing points. Beautiful. Great. That's okay. I'll just dock your pay. Excellent. Cute smile, love it. Nice. Okay, guys, so now that's without the fill light. So as the, as the images come in from the camera, you will see that you have a really nice sort of rim or edge lighting around her. That's why it's called a rim light. And, but if you notice the shadows back and outside, the reason why that is I actually moved the reflector out of the way. I did it unintentionally so you could really see the light. What you could do a lot of times is you could actually just add that light to one side. Actually, Rick, do me a quick favor. Move that light more to the other side. So it would be to camera left. Yeah. And this is a very, very common. I'm just going to take a couple of quick shots. And the reason why you do this is because now where the dark side is, it will be filled by that nice hot light. So with a couple of lights, you get very dramatic portraits. So let me just take another couple of quick shots. Now granted, I realize that in this position I am seeing, I'm hiding the stand behind her so I don't see the light stand because it is directly behind her right now. Beautiful. Okay. Let's wait for those images to come in. And now you'll see it on one side as opposed to the other. So what I'm going to do now is I still think it's too dark on that side, so let me add the fill back in, or a reflector. And let's get this to three-point lighting, which I'll discuss next. So I'm just going to grab my reflector, and I'm going to move it into position. Try not to crash it into the boom too much. Okay. Actually, Rick, could you do me a favor, please, and move that back to the center position? Thank you. So we're moving our kicker light back into the center of our head, so it's facing directly to the center. And we're also adding in our fill light. So now we're doing what is traditionally known as three-point lighting. So three-point lighting is the most basic. If you've ever studied broadcast lighting or anything like that, you will learn three-point lighting. And that's your key or your main light. Your fill, which reduces the shadow created by the key light. And of course, your separator or your background light. So now we have sort of all three in effect. Let's take a couple of shots and see what we get. Excellent. Beautiful. Chin down just a touch. Nice. Okay. So we'll wait for those images to come in, and as you'll see, that side's going to open up again, and now you'll have a much more balanced exposure overall. As you see, you still see your nice triangle on the side, so you still know it's Rembrandt, but the shadows are not as pronounced. So one last thing I want to show you before we complete. First of all, I want to thank Candace very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. It's been a pleasure. And what I'm going to show you guys now is the proper way to break down the C-stand. It's pretty simple, but there are a couple of key things that you really have to know, especially if you're going to handle them or handle them with other people for safety features. So what I'm going to do is... I am going to pull this one down. Thank you, I'll grab, the, I'll grab the arm itself. Okay, so now we're back to our kit, which consists of our stand, our head, and our arm. So, traditionally, when they're together, they look like this. They're like soldiers ready for grip battle, if you will. And they're usually set like this. Things you must know is, number one, a lot of these times you'll hand these back and forth off a truck to someone. Actually, Joe, if you could sort of zoom down to where my hand is around the riser section. What you never want to do is hold it like this. Because if the person grabbing it grabs this and squeezes it together, they will crush your hand. It happens quite often. So what you want to do is when you grab them, you always want to grab around both the stand and the grip arm. Very, very important. Number two is you want to make sure that your keys or your knobs are really tight. Because what happens, if you think about the height of your average truck, it's about eye level. So if someone's handing you a stand and this is loose and this comes charging at your face, it could be slightly dangerous. And us as image makers, we really value our eyes. I know it's a small thing, we're high maintenance, but what can we do? So you want to make sure that all of your keys and knobs are nice and tight. And you want to make sure, of course, your grip head's nice and tight too, because you don't want nothing, none of this jiggling around. And that will ensure that both you and the person you're handing the stand to won't get crushed fingers and they won't have um, holes where they used to have eyes in their head. So now we have some questions, and let's see what we got here. So I'm going to answer some questions for you guys. First question is, why ASA 160? That's an excellent question. When it comes to ISOs or ASAs, when it comes to Canon, 
they have tested all the ASAs, and 160 produces much better signal-to-noise ratios, much less noise than you would get at 100 ISO, so that's why we chose 160. And the other question is, why aren't, sand, why aren't there sandbags on the base of the boom stand? That is a very great, I, it's a very good question, and simply, we don't have enough. We were doing three productions today at once, and yes, in the production that I was doing, I would always have sandbags in all the stands. And lastly, the question, with a reflector stand, what if you wanted to use it outside? Is there a way to hold it down so it won't blow in the breeze? Yes, quite simply, you could use two C-stand kits with two arms and two sets, and that way you could hold it both top and bottom, and you could hold it firmly, even in a heavy breeze. So, that's basically a wrap, guys. I would like to thank our sponsors, Kupo, and of course I want to thank our model, and when it comes to your vision, as well as your grip equipment, we like to say at Kupo Grip, never let go. Thank you very much.